We are live with this hard truths number three with Dave Rossi. The purpose of hard truths is to get to those hard truths that no one wants to believe, the science that we don't understand. And so we are trying to get to it down with the people that are the experts, the engineers and the physicists. Today, I bring you Dave Rossi, defense engineer, tech, uh, works with experiments in advanced propulsion. Dave, thank you for being here, sir. Ashton, thank you so much for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So first of all, let's just dig in. What is your background, Dave? How did you get involved with, uh, you know, defense contracting, advanced propulsion, whatever you can tell us? I don't want to push sure. too deep and, you know, get sure. you in any trouble, but whatever you're free to tell us, go ahead. No problem. Long story short, um, I started a, a podcast, uh, which led me about two years into doing that podcast, maybe a year and a half into wanting to essentially not so much study and analyze uh, information and data as much as I loved it, but said to myself, why not try and build something and more of an intuitive sort of notion. And so ended up assembling a, a couple of things that got the attention of some, uh, some interesting people out of the United States in particular. Um, it probably didn't help that at where I was at the time, was relatively close to a military base that was in, in Canada, uh, because I'm from Toronto, Canada, but uh, got the attention of some individuals uh, presented to various individuals at the um, the DOD. This is a couple years ago at this point. Uh, from there, moved into establishing my own company that does consulting and contracting for um, basically the, I guess you could say some of the more alternative or fringe physics that mainstream science would like to call it as such. But um, in my opinion, is physics that's sort of been uh, hidden in plain sight, if you will, uh, for quite some time that I think people should understand and grasp more and more because it's really creating a um, a cognitive dissonance, in my opinion, with respects to what people see on their phones and what they see in person. And the, the the topics of debate in that angle have really swayed from what the science has been able to do from my experiments and experience, uh, whether it's in the laboratory, um, theoretically, but of course, experimentally would be the most important thing. And so when I saw, for example, <clears throat> the um the mh370 footage i i said to myself i know there's a lot of people out there saying it's it's not legitimate or what have you but i'm of the opinion that um it very well is legitimate based on experiments that i've conducted on much smaller scales and so i kind of have one foot in the uh, uh the defense contracting area on a sort of small to middle level and then one foot out in the in the public because I think that there needs to be a way to get this this knowledge out there um, without uh, to a degree without, um, I guess you could say, permitting people to understand how to build these things and then weaponize them, but perhaps gain an understanding to realize that there's a responsibility we have if we're going to be discussing these types of technologies and the consequences they have. So long story short, made some various presentations to some individuals at uh, DOD was sort of thrown around to some different departments of it. And then from there decided that I didn't want to be an employee, but rather a contractor consultant. And so from there, I've been gracious enough to work on certain projects that uh, uh, again, are sound extremely out there, but if we see if we look at the literature, for example, science fact has outstripped science fiction for for quite some time. It just becomes quote unquote unbelievable when it translates from you know a, a physics paper to an experiment in the laboratory. But that's sort of the the general abstract uh, background story of how I got into all of this. I don't have any uh, actual degrees. Um, I'm self taught, and I think that's perhaps in the humblest way I could say is perhaps what impressed some of these uh, DOD individuals the most. And then from there, uh, I tend to have a knack for it, uh, still work very hard, but at the same time, uh, want to try and bring some of this understanding and knowledge out to the public in a simplistic fashion. So it becomes very easy to understand, which is hopefully something we can do here today. We can sort of jump between the complex elements of it and translate that into a, a simple understanding for the not so scientific individuals. Yeah, the people like me. So I guess what I got out of that is you're Canadian. <laughs> and we'll give you yes. a pass on that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. No, yep. I love I love all our Canadian brothers and sisters out there. But uh, no, I think the real important part there is that you actually work on the experimental side. You know, the biggest right. thing that I heard is that You've done experiments that led you to when you looked at the videos, thought, oh, wow, you know, this could be consistent with some of the work that I've done, right. which is really what I'm hoping we can dig into a lot today in terms of going through the science aspect. And I know you're super smart, much smarter than I am, at least especially when it comes to the science aspects here. So, you know, any of that stuff where you want to name drop the, uh, you know, scientific papers and physicists, et cetera, for our academic uh, academics who are following 
That's right. great. And then for our layman, you know, we can kind of talk about some analogies about, you know, what this really means on, on the surface level. Cause I think right. the big takeaway that you just mentioned there is the advanced scientific concepts that people think are fantastical, but the reality is we are just, we are on the verge of changing the world. And, you know, I think that some of the experiments that I've seen that you've shown me, um, will help prove that. So right. let's jump right into it, sir. Um, where do you want to begin in terms of wh which scientific aspect would you like to dig into first? Sure. Well, there's a few different things that we can start with. One of the things that I would like to say, if I could, is that sure. for the audience in general is we want, let's start with some simple concepts. We want to realize that a lot of these effects that we're seeing, whether it's out of the MH370 video or whether it's out of, um, you know, a UAP or, you know, even paranormal experiences, a lot of this has to do with the notion of curving space time, essentially not viewing things as a straight line, but rather as a curve. Now, what becomes very interesting there is that this was discovered, and I'm not claiming that anything that I had developed was actually a novel discovery, but I would dare to say was a rediscovery. Um, I, I know there have been many individuals before me, even before my time that discovered the same things and were suppressed, unfortunately. Um, but we want to focus on the notion of curving space time and that the idea of creating either a curve in space time or creating an x if you will whether it's using light or whether it's using electromagnetism begins to detect and transmit and also emit some very interesting phenomena now a practical example of this curving of space time if you will has to do with the utilization of for example LIGO, the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Observatory, we see that through the intersection, at the point at where the lasers intersect, it's been claimed we can detect gravity waves. Now, what's interesting is that we see the notion of intersection is very similar to sort of a stacked books example. And that that is that we have one laser beam, and then we have another beam that interferes. But that second beam, we can argue, is in a sort of superposition type of we could say setup that is over top the first beam, which gives a hint, perhaps, that a lot of these effects that we see, whether it's through the orbs and the uh, on the on flight three seventy or uh, we through other uh, you know UAP and paranormal phenomena, these effects may be of what we call in science second order. So, in other words, one must meet certain conditions electromagnetically, for example, to then give birth to this second effect. Now. Giving birth to this second effect is what has been privately referred to as something called phase conjugation. Essentially, that's a fancy way for saying that the particles make love instead of fight. If the particles fight or clash, they create what we have known for decades to be called explosions. But if at the Planck level, using things, for example, like um, uh, interferometers or using things like uh, superconductors or even, as Mr. Paez said, room temperature superconductors, if these particles can actually entangle or hug themselves, if you will, what happens is once they do that, and I'm using my hands to give hopefully a visual <laughs> effect I can, what happens is they start to become self-assembling <laughs> and they essentially start to curve into each other in a toroidal fashion. Now, on the theoretical side, we know that Einstein's theory of general relativity permits for the curving of space-time and essentially permits for torsion, and it's in there, but it's been vastly dismissed for a number of reasons. We can, dare I say, we can say this has been the case for diabolical reasons. Point being is that there are certain concepts that exist within particle physics that don't exist within electrical engineering. And this ultimately has to do with the fact that certain institutions like the National Science Foundation and other groups pass down these models to these new smart students who are very smart, yes, but they're not going to be questioning the status quo, and they're definitely not going to be questioning the current models that are given to them. Now, these models that are given assume a flat space time, not a curved one. So this is why, for example, when we see, uh, for example, ISS footage um, that that sees that has speculatively seen craft that seem to have a sort of concave bubble around them, mm -hmm. that makes perfect sense because from my experiments and others, what you'll find is that the laboratory observer, if he is not within that curved space time, at best, even if he's say five feet away from that experiment, at best he is going to see the flat intersection of that phenomenon. 
He's mm-hmm. not going to see that phenomena in curved space time. And in order to see it in curved space time, on for my science friends, we need to assume a three uh, three spatial dimensions and one time dimension in a Lagrangian form. For those that may be interested in understanding the real theoretical side, we then use what's called Stokes theorem to induce contour integrals to then essentially create a second order effect that can actually go all the way up to uh, to twelve space with so twelve spatial dimensions and one time dimension. These theoretical uh, concepts whether it's Landau and Lefschitz, whether it's Myron Evans, whether it's Terry Barrett, whether it's Tom Bearden, whether it's, uh, in to, to a certain degree, uh, Dr. Hal Pudoff, whether it's uh, Sal Paez's super force, these are all, in my opinion, saying essentially the same things, which are that when you include torsion and the curving of space-time, you can get the effects that we've seen, for example, in a vortex-like manner, uh, very much akin to uh, the, three, the MH370 footage. Mm-hmm. Now, what's very interesting about all of this is that This gives rise to something that many university students should know about, particularly in optical physics, which is something called um, SPDC, stimulated parametric down conversion. And it's also been called second harmonic generation, as well as SPUC, stimulated parametric up conversion. What this is essentially doing is it's taking the curvature of space time right? Using the magnetic A field, the magnetic vector potential, which is a fancy way for saying basically the empty space, empty space, quote unquote, of the vacuum or ether that the magnetic flux has allowed for you to have. And then it is combining that with a dielectric curvature, essentially, that then creates what's called a gradient, which allows for a second effect to occur. Now, what is that effect? The second effect that occurs after um, uh, electromagnetism and light meet a certain condition is sound. Sound is what we now call phonons with an N. Instead of photons for light, we have phonons with an N. Now, what we're seeing is we're seeing that same concept with the laser beam sort of beam one and beam two, except now these are not beams in this case. We're doing phase conjugation, second harmonic generation using, uh, in this particular case, uh, electromagnetism and light. So after the sound concept or the sound particle is reached, the question becomes what comes after that? Yeah. Now, it's very interesting because publicly phonons have a sp- are a spin zero particle. In my opinion, they should rather be a spin 1.5 or a spin two because they give rise to the effects that we see in, for example, the MH370 video. Um, Mm -hmm. With that said, if I could just sort of wrap this up. We, in terms of us humans on the surface level, uh, whether it's with our cameras or with our, uh, you know, detectors or what have you, we can only collect as good of as good of the data as the detectors that we uh, deploy and emit in certain these instances. So when we see the sudden disappearance of this plane craft, for example, uh, with these orbs creating a a vortex like what seems to be, dare I say, wormhole effect, uh, depositing energy at a particular point, um, the camera is only going to pick up the flat effect of that because the camera by definition does not know how to render something that is topologically stable in a higher dimension, literally. And so that is what will also create the effect of things that begin to pixelate, for example, uh, certain, uh, whether it's uh, software editors or cameras and so on. Because when one can bend a gravitational wave using these second order effects, you begin to bend light as well. And we know we notice that light and gravity tend to be very, very close to one another. And so if you can bend the light using either refractive or diffractive properties, you can not just make yourself invisible, you can then induce a state that has an anti-photon uh, path, meaning essentially the negentropic uh, version of what we normally see as linear time. Negentropic means time reversed. Yeah. And we know through, for example, out of Los Alamos, Hochberg and Visser proved that the throat of a wormhole is all one needs to both make and understand and engineer such a traversable effect uh, or a wormhole itself. Because when you tap that zero point, you tap essentially the oscillation or the zitterbuegung of the local particles. And those local particles, if certain conditions are met where 
external interactions of those particles make love or entangle with that zero point, which could be anywhere in space time that you pick, literally, you can begin to induce the effects that we've seen both in the video and otherwise. And, and we know, for example, that if, if we look in the literature with respects to uh, vortex dynamics or vortexes are seen in, in superfluids and superconductors, the literature is there. All one has to do is essentially scale that up in their mind. Now, to wrap this up, I'll say I'm not asking for anyone to blindly believe me, but listen to what I'm saying and do your research. You'll find that these vortexes tend to appear over and over and tend to give rise to a lot of what we're seeing, um, whether it's in the 370 videos or otherwise. And those effects will create what's called a lens thurring frame dragging effect the same uh, the same way for example that if you take your mouse on a very old computer you pick up an icon on your home screen and you drag it across the screen really quick you sort of see that delay of the mouse yeah. kind of going back and forth that would be the same type of effect that we would see um when space time is curved mm -hmm. just for a simple curving of space time instead of thinking of space time as being linear and straight so oh. Yeah, so yeah that's, that, that's awesome, man. I have a couple of follow-up questions on some of those sure. points. So first, I guess I want to talk a little bit about LIGO because I've heard LIGO get talked about a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on exactly the experiments? Because my understanding is that the LIGO experiments have had to do with looking at neutron stars and detecting gravitational waves coming from neutron stars that are interacting with one another. You know, What more can you teach us about the impacts of what the LIGO experiments have done and what they are? Sure. Well, not not to be a, a conspiracy theorist, if you will, but I think that there's a lot that LIGO has not revealed when it comes to detecting gravitational waves and detecting various other things in um, uh, in in our even within our own atmosphere, let alone within you know neutron stars and all that kind of stuff. And the the reason I say that is because we find that. Um, all of our telescopes today have convex lenses rather than concave ones. And so it's of my opinion that when LIGO, whether they publicly state this or not, is a different conversation. But it is of my opinion they are seeing far more than they let they let on. In addition to, um, I do believe that LIGO, if they, if they shifted their detectors to looking for high frequency interference events, they would see basically craft all over the place. And the reason being is because... The second, and we, we know this from a basic double, a dual slit uh, experiment you can do with a laser beam and get a guitar string to split the beam and uh, deploy some, uh, I believe Chris Lido did it a year or two ago, um, deploy some mist, if you will, on the beam in a dark room. You'll begin to see literally the waves or the flux of the vacuum or quantum vacuum or ether begin to occur. Now, if you apply that to a multi-million dollar tool like LIGO, um, I think what will begin to happen is you will begin to see a lot of gravitational waves, um, not necessarily perhaps as a fundamental energy, but as an emerging energy from the curving of space time. And that, that curve essentially deals with the way, again, when you create an X with a laser beam, the more, and the more beams you intersect, say you have one beam and then two, say you have a third one and then a fourth one and then a fifth one, and it keeps stacking in that regard. Not only does that uh, subscribe to superposition and topology, but what you begin to do is you begin to create a caduceus like curve that acts as a sort of transducer that can both, uh, in this particular case, detect gravitational waves. And I think that through that, uh, we can find on the high frequency side quite a bit of perhaps what our own military is doing, as well as maybe others as well, uh, because those gravitational waves would have to be, um, I, how can you say, longitudinally locked in with various craft for those craft to operate, which would explain why, for example, during cases of EMPs or um, uh, we see, for example, ultra, ultra wideband radar tests being done and craft get close to those fields, they begin to uh, crash because of the fact that the gravitational coherence has been completely dismantled uh, because these radar uh, detectors or, you know, these devices that are being deployed and tested in these ranges, these nuclear facilities or in this general area, essentially untangles or um, how can I say, uh, unkinks, basically. Mm -hmm the energy that would be encompassing both the warp drive or the warp bubble around the craft, as well as any other effects that it could be doing outside or inside the craft as well. That's really interesting because I think that from the UFOlogy perspective, there's this big argument that the people that are against it say is, well, if these craft are so advanced, how are they crashing, right? Shouldn't they be invincible? And I always thought, well, just because you build something for a specific purpose doesn't mean it's impenetrable from all other effects. Well, right? I think mistakes it, and stuff, but right. Yeah. I think as well, if I could say very quickly, we yeah. have to look at the 
we have to look at the planet as well with respects to the the Tesla technology. We must, in my opinion, look at the planet as uh, one big capacitor. And if we follow the notion of us being, for example, organic um, particle accelerators or organic electromagnetic beings, it gives substantiation to when one goes outside and grounds themselves in you know bare feet. They tend to find they feel more energy and whatnot to tend to come to them or anything of this nature. And even as we see, for example, in basic electrical engineering, we know that grounding rods are needed because if not, the electricity begins to arc arc means it begins to curve so that is already nature giving us a hint naturally that space time or the the quantum vacuum wants to curve instead of actually behave in a linear fashion now if i can give one example for those in the audience that may be interested in more of the liquid chemistry side um say we take a hydroxide and we take an acid in the laboratory we put it in a petri dish or what have you and we neutralize the two and what normally happens is we expect to get heat or what's called an exothermic reaction from this this uh, this um, this neutralization. But what happens if you neutralize the two and you don't get any heat? There's no exothermic reaction. What that is indicating is that there is an effect going on that is surpassing the current flat theoretical space-time model and interpretation that is giving rise to torsion longitudinally not with the X or Y axis on a Cartesian plane, but with a Z or Z axis that gives depth now. And so what that tells us is that there is a particular set of properties within that specific hydroxide and acid that that stabilizes disequilibrium. So it prevents an exothermic reaction. And what I mean by that essentially is a visual would be uh, Pac-Man's mouth. Basically, all the devices that we use, all of the things that were taught in mainstream physics and, and even in general, has assumed that, for example, Pac-Man has a closed mouth, meaning that if you put energy inside of Pac-Man, there's only so much you could put in because it's in a closed system. Now, if Pac-Man's mouth opens up, is it possible to use the local vacuum as the actual engine itself? And that is what gives rise to these second order effects. It's in, dare I say, fractal. I don't think it's that far off from people who have had, you know, uh, psychedelic experiences where they say they're always seeing spirals and fractals of spirals and so on. I would say there's certainly something there in my opinion. Huh. So, wow. yeah. That's yeah. that's really closely aligns with our last podcast guest, which was Bob Greenier and his right. uh, theory of, you know, fractal toroidal moments. Right. And toroids as well. It's like, it seems like everything comes back to toroids. Can you explain why that shape is so important? Is it just due to curvature? Is that with, you know, what gets created from curvature naturally? Or is there? Sure. Uh, It seems as though um, one thing I'll tell you is that the more I experiment and the more I, I do my research, even the private research, especially the more I realize I don't know anything about anything, just to be clear. And to me, that, that that speaks to me philosophically as in the joy is in the journey. But it seems as though that there is a strong indication that there is um, within this structure of our reality, uh, putting the electromagnetic uh, f- basis or pillars of it aside um, from a geometric standpoint, it seems as though these toroids and toroidal geometries tend to comprise everything that exists in one form or another um not that doesn't mean that we always see them as toroidal but we see for example that uh curves and spirals are quite common within for example the way that nature is self-assembling or the way that nature manifests and so on and so forth uh we found as well that it's been shown in the if in the absence of electro uh, electric and magnetic fields in a laboratory experiment in a closed off room in the absence of e and b fields you still have toroidal geometries that are resonating there that occur which implies that this quantum vacuum or this ether has a very strong resonance to it that may in fact have a dare i say a a resonant memory that can store memory in that regard so when we look at all of these different angles it comes down to the fact that the universe slash reality that uh, that we are in uh tends to um really like the vortex toroidal geometry of this reality at the core of it i couldn't tell you why uh the same way that i must quote mr Feynman when he said that if you look at um energy or force we ultimately we don't after a certain point we don't know what things are we don't have an adequate definition of force there's no definition of what energy ultimately is and so that's when i think it turns into more of a philosophical a metaphysical debate rather than a, a, a physical one a, or a physics debate but i think that's sort of the beauty of all of this the the merging of these two 
uh, material and non-material world of the very large and very small come to integrate in that in that sense. Hopefully, I, I answered the question, but ultimately, oh, I, I I couldn't tell you other than what I'm familiar with experimentally, which is that nature and reality seems to be toroidal, even in the absence of major uh, components like electricity and magnetism. Yeah, so I think one other thing you mentioned too is the Pac-Man uh, analogy, right. which I thought was really interesting. Because to me, when I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking, is this a, a capability of free energy being kind of sucked out of the vacuum state of the universe, right? And I think that's something that I had seen on some science shows some years back as well, which right. I always thought was very interesting that space isn't empty. There's stuff going on there in space. Right. So is that what you were kind of digging at, that that could be theoretically possible? 100%. I think it's more than theoretical. I, 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 As a matter of fact, I know it's engineer. It's possible in an engineering sense to the point where we can make a strong argument that the devices or the craft or the things that we build, um, regardless of what they are, whether it's uh, uh, metallic orbs or something else, whether it's the uh, coming from us or others, if you will, um, Ultimately, these devices, whether they're for generating over unity, meaning you get more energy coming out than what you put into a device, mm -hmm. or for generating uh, lift and propulsion in a in an instant inertia like sense or the notion of defying gravity and all of that. I think at the end of the day, no matter which way you um, you slice it, you're going to have an effect that will uh, how can I put this um, utilize these devices as sort of. Um, let me think, uh, sort of facilitators of the energy that's already been all around us. Yeah. If that makes sense. So we're, we're sort of, um, shaping what nature is shaping to what nature is trying to, to tell us. Yeah. That's awesome. So to speak. Yeah. And, uh, not to rewind too much, but I, I thought there was an analogy that I wanted to bring up when you were talking sure. about the radars that were, you know, I'm just gonna say it probably interfering with UAPs or other craft right. that are out there that are floating freely, now, the analogy that I think of there is because uh, I like the Marvel movies is like the or actually maybe it's not Marvel, but Venom when Venom, the he gets hit by Sonic attack. Right. That's his weakness that makes the right. symbiote like get, yes. you know, it's, it's it's like it's weakness. Right. Or it's like it's kryptonite. If you want to think of right. it from a Superman analogy, would that be accurate in terms of what you think the interaction there is with the radar is that we don't need a weapon. It's like we're just the radar and, you know, manipulating the electromagnetic fields can, you know, destabilize the propulsion of some of these craft. Is that what you're just hypothetically thinking there? This to a to a strong degree, yes. And this is where, as a matter of fact, I must give the credit to um, Eric Weinstein because this, uh, in the with respects to what I'm about to say in particular, I don't agree with Mr. Weinstein in a lot of areas, but in in this area I do, which is that um, this is a form of understanding science more than technology. There's a difference, mm. and I, I appreciated when Mr. Weinstein said that quite some time ago. Uh, in his conversation with Dr. Pudoff, which is where he said, I wouldn't be thinking about new technology, but a new understanding of science, basically doing to uh, to Einstein what Einstein did to Newton in terms of finding a more fundamental uh, way of understanding the universe and therefore allowing for vacuum extraction and such to occur. And I believe that that is uh, definitely what, what what is happening. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I think it, it, what's happening as well for a very simple description is we're essentially we're seeing this. Basically, if I showed you a uh, this water bottle and I said and I covered the bottom half of it and I said, Ashton, uh, you only see the top half. And then you go, Dave, what are you talking about? You just covered the bottom half. And then I go, no, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. And then I start calling you names and attacking you. <laughs> Yeah. That's basically what's happening in the scientific community. There is a refusal to acknowledge this other half of, I'm not kidding, whether it's in chemistry, whether it's in particle physics, condensed matter physics, except for at the classified levels or at the, uh, you know, at the levels of uh, the military industrial complex on the contractor side. But um, yeah, it's unfortunate yeah. to see that that some have tried to uh, put a sort of intellectual property label on science that should be discoverable for all. And so it, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of unfortunate in that sense, but that's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm speaking with you today as well. So. Yeah. Two things I want to get in my soapbox real quick is that I always evaluate people based on the things that they say. You know, I think that mm. what you brought up today is that you no, know, you don't have the formal training and schooling and what nope. have you, but you taught yourself, right? And the things that you're saying, we don't have to believe what you're saying. We can verify them. You know, right. that's something that I say myself in my own investigation, which I think right. lends a huge amount of credibility to your statements. Is that people? I, uh, go ahead. Yeah. 
If you I appreciate that because the um, it, it's it. I will say it's not an easy thing to do. But if one looks at the academic literature uh, from the late 1800s up until today, if one knows what to pick out and what to find in terms of where to look with regards to this angle of science being suppressed, it is there. Um, yeah. The effects are also being hidden in sort of code words that in terms of modern publications, uh, the effects are there and they do exist. Um, that's one of the things that's also uh, frustrated me quite avidly, which is that uh, people quite often say, well, where's the proof? I want to see peer reviewed uh, literature. Yeah. It's been there. It's been there for decades except we need to realize that these people manipulate words. These institutions publish papers um, in a certain, um, you know, the same way, for example, that if um, uh, the same way that you would label something with, a, for example, talking about instead of the word oil, we can say hydrocarbons. It yeah. means the same thing, but perceptually it doesn't interest people. And so therefore they never look at it, but it is there. So, no, and that's part of the reason why I do this podcast is that so much of science of what I've realized is a matter of, uh, you know, using the right words. Right. It's a matter of uh, uh, <laughs> names dropping or slipping my mind. But what I was going to get at as well is that a lot of what you're doing, you know, I think that scientists have this idea or academics, I'll call them not necessarily scientists, of cutting each other down, saying, oh, that can't be possible. This can't be possible. Science is a matter of right. building on each other's work, adding to right. it, right? Right. It's not usually that someone was wrong. It's that they didn't have an interpretation. Our interpretations advance. Our understanding advances, right? right? It's not that Einstein was wrong. He's, I think he's one of the greatest minds ever in the history of the world. It's just that he ran out of time, right? If he had kept, but had infinite time, his own understanding probably would have advanced as well. There's right? speculation behind the, there's speculation behind the scenes, the rumors that have gone around for decades that he in fact realized where he went wrong at a classified level. And really? had before he died, had known, yeah, where he looked at Maxwell's uh, heavy sides interpretation of Maxwell's equations and said, Holy shit, I've been wrong. Um mm -hmm. There's some some documents behind the scenes that do substantiate that, but that that go, gives rise to what Mr. Paez said that I cannot emphasize enough, which is it makes one wonder how long has this been known for? And this, we can argue, goes all the way back to the late 1880s, basically. Um, if I could say very quickly, to give context to more of the scientific uh, side of the audience, um, yeah. essentially what happened was that Ma heavy sides interpretation of Maxwell's quaternions found an analogy between electromagnetism and gravity, a direct connection between the two. Now, it's been largely rumored that heavy side, in fact, screwed up these equations when it's quite to the contrary. Um, essentially, what's been what's been th what happened was that there was a sort of an interpretation made by uh, um, pointing, as we know, named after the uh, pointing vector uh, these days, as well as heavy side. And what essentially happened there was that heavy side found this incredible uh, top topological effect in theory that the great Heinrich Lorentz also noticed as well. He understood both angles of these different gentlemen's perspective in terms of interpreting Maxwell's quaternions. Lorentz basically said at the time, my God, there's far more energy coming out of the uh, the generator than what we're putting into the shaft. Of a, of a certain circuit, for example, he didn't know how to explain it because at the time you would have been violently attacked as being a perpetual motion nut. So what he did was he spoke about it in, in uh, vectored angles. And he said the energy, this outpouring of energy that is that has far more coming out than what we're putting in has no physical significance. That's basically like saying that you got a big boat on your water and you got all this wind going around you, but the wind doesn't touch your boat. Now, what if you found a way to take that wind and bring it to your boat so it could push your boat, but it, but instead someone on the boat goes, no, 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 it's not touching our boat, so it can never be done, forget it. That's basically what happened. And then it later on got the 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 equations and all of that got um, got classified. We see, for example, even in the 1980s under the setup of the direct energy weapons uh, um, uh, SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative under Reagan with NORAD, Edward Teller went on a show i forgot the name of the show um not 
not Dick Cavett. He went on an, I forgot the guy's name, shoot. But anyways, point being was that it was more of a show that had a more intellectual discussion. And even Mr. Edward Teller talked about how even in the 80s, those that were not privy or given access to the, the classified equations that proved that these direct energy weapons could be possible thought it was nonsense until they were, a lot of these professors were brought in and briefed on it. And Teller said he felt even in the 80s that there was far too much secrecy being driven to classification in North America. He he said at the time, which he was right, he goes, the Soviets have access to this literature openly. And in North America, we're classifying it. So yeah. it's been there. But yeah, I mean, so I can, I can, yeah, yeah, keep going. yeah. Oh. no, I can, I can give example after example. So. <laughs> I'm but, loving yeah. all the knowledge, honestly. And I think the chat as well. And everybody who's listening in as well is, is enjoying it. I think that the word I was looking for earlier is the syntax, right? Is that the syntax that we use is so important in science and it also develops right. over time. You know, as part of the case that I've been doing, I've been developing my syntax. We moved away from like black hole, right. wormhole, and now we're talking about macroscopic phase conjugation and potentially the unification of quantum and macro, which I, I want right. to discuss with you here in a moment as well. I think that the one thing I wanted to ask before that, though, is when you talked about the, uh, I don't know if it was the photons or the waves, the particles making love and not war, are yeah. we talking about the same concept as Bose-Einstein condensate there, where we are moving fermions to bosons, or is that something different? Uh, actually, well, Bose, a very good question. I appreciate it. Bose-Einstein condensates give rise to those effects. Bose-Einstein condensates create the appropriate environment for those effects to occur, for the second order entanglement and past that third order, fourth order, all the way up to 12th order effects to occur. But second order effects already induce what you've seen in the 370 video, for example. So let's just stick to second effect order effects for now. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So just hypothetically, though, what is above those order effects? Like, how would we how would you describe that or give an analogy to what that is? Because, I mean, if, if second order effects is what we're seeing in MH370 videos, we're already talking about magic, in my opinion. Right. So, this is, well, this is where, again, it becomes yeah. indiscernible. And so this is why um, we start to get into uh, I don't even know how to describe it. So a basic example of uh, just a second order effect would not just be the 370 video, but uh, for example, say I'll, I'll give an example for the females in the audience where um, imagine your purse, you go out for a dinner with some friends and you say, oh my gosh, I forgot my phone at home. Instead of driving all the way back home, imagine unzipping your purse and opening it and seeing a, a part of your room there, reaching your hand through the purse and then your hand, it actually comes out the other end in your room and then wow. you grab your phone from your desk and you bring it back up. That's a second order effect. When we get into anything past that, yeah. you start getting into, I'm hesitant to say this, so I say this very carefully, yeah. uh, speculatively, but you start to get into some things that are seen like in the Doctor Strange movies and when the, you see the dimensional uh, fractals and all that kind of stuff operate and it becomes uh, very, very interesting. Now, if you took any of that and you took your phone and you filmed it while you're in the lab, basically your phone, unless you were actually, no, even if you were inside it, because the lens is convex that you would essentially, your phone would get blurred like crazy. It would be zooming in and out of focus. It wouldn't it it'd start going haywire basically, because there's this, um, again, if we go back to dragging that mouse across mm -hmm. your screen, seeing the drag effect, that's basically what's happening in the laboratory in the vicinity of the, uh, of the phase conjugation occurring. Interesting. Yeah, so I think I'll maybe along those same lines of if it's not, you know, correct me is that when you talked about the laser beams kind of uh, converging on a point, the thing that right. confuses me about that is that uh, photons are bosons, right? So they can stack on each other on the same point. So right. if that's the case, when why when we shoot lasers at each other, do they not just stack up or are you saying they do stack up? But why are they then causing this additional order effect to occur? You know, why are they curving or uh, f forming that caduceus or whatever it was that you were mentioning before? Sure, like, sure. This, you explain this, that? Yeah, sure. No problem. So ideally, this isn't as simple as just taking two lasers and intersecting them to be clear. This right. has to do with uh, inducing this effect at the Planck scale at first, which is why, uh, in my opinion, Mr. Paez emphasizes superconductors quite often because we know, for example, that uh, certain types of um, parametric oscillators, certain types of UV lasers um, mixed with superconductive properties can access this plane or, or if even putting superconductors aside, making these lasers interact inside of a Bose-Einstein condensate first allows the, uh, the Planck scale to lock in with the field interaction, if you will. From there, what happens is there is 
this and this caduceus like effect as well is reminiscent not just within our dna but dare i say within the overall nature of the toroidal reality that we're in so this caduceus effect is something else as well that i will say is by definition not something i can explain as to why it's there except for the fact that it is part of the toroidal curving of space time in general um that seems to again it, it explain quite a bit of the quote-unquote um uh incomplete or incomplete theories publicly but it's dare i say it's so eloquently simple that it's been dismissed and it's been right under our noses the whole time having to do with essentially the the square root of electric permittivity and magnetic permeability but as to why that caduceus forms uh as per your question I can't necessarily say other than the fact that when we think about curving space time and then we curve it to another second order, we're going to see those curves start to essentially assimilate and self-assemble when oscillated as well. Mm -hmm. But they must lock in at the Planck level first. So this is not as simple as just taking two laser beams and make like, you know, from from uh, Amazon, yeah. Walmart and just shooting, <laughs> making them intersect. I wish it was that simple. It's not that simple ultimately. But um, although in fairness, there have been quite a few people that have, uh, for example, I have a, a Patreon when, uh, from when I start had the show. And there are some people on there, for example, that are getting some very interesting effects without mm -hmm. having to lock in at the Planck scale. So, and so two follow up questions on that. Well, first one, I guess, is how do we define the Planck scale? So just for people like sure. me and people who are less versed in the academic side of it, like when we're talking about Planck scale, are we talking about just very small, small scales, is that sizes, or what are we talking about? There? The smallest, the smallest form of uh, observable and measurable matter physical matter that we know of. Now, what I'm going to say here is probably going to be very controversial, but um, it has been confirmed many decades ago behind the scenes in a private regard that the smallest forms of matter are cubes in nature, um, which is why one can make a strong argument that the force of anti-gravity is proportional to the square root of the electric permittivity. And if it's, if it's something that simple, you can then begin to engineer things like what you see in Mr. Piaz's patents, which you could see why it would anger other groups or factions that don't want this to come out, because it shows in certain ways how simple the engineering approach is. And so the idea is that the smallest forms of matter at Planck or at the Planck scale are cubic or cubes in nature. Now, if you can somehow manipulate that matter to rise up those to make those cubes rise up and begin to revolve around an orbit or an axis that you've created those cubes again what happens is they start to go from having um corners and angles to surpassing the schwinger limit as paez has talked about they begin to curve mm -hmm. and those cubes begin to self-assemble longitudinally and they form that helix that or that caduceus that we've been talking about and again this is very prominent and reminiscent within the 370 video we see of again a caduceus like vortex being formed around the craft before the effect occurs mm -hmm. as well as we see um you know people have talked about um having experiences while you know with paranormal entities or you know on psychedelics etc and i'm gonna say something here that some people may either go oh my gosh this guy doesn't know what he's talking about or they'll go my gosh this makes sense hopefully they'll go with the latter but um a lot of people claim to have experiences whether it's paranormal or what have you and they see beings or what they think are you know deceased relatives or or something like this with the corner of their eye photons in this reality are the only particles humans can see the full spectrum of now what happens is as we've been talking about when you curve space time you begin to get these effects we notice as well that if our eyes are like miniature movie projectors the corner of our eyes may in fact be able to reveal more than looking straight at something we we know this is there's some feasibility here because when you go into a dark room it's actually, and you turn the lights off very quickly, the corner of your eyes begin to adapt to what you can see much more rapidly than the center. Mm. And so this goes back to the notion of, again, optics, bending gravity, therefore bends light, and so on and so forth. Mm. So which explains as well why people, for example, say, oh my gosh, I saw a craft in the sky very clearly. But then when I filmed it with my phone, it looked like a blurry sort of yeah. uh, pixelation going on. It's possible we have concave-like properties within the lenses of our eyes that our cameras do not, wow. which is why we see things more clearly. And then the cameras themselves continue to pixelate in a frame-dragging type effect. 
Yeah. So it's not even just a matter of what the resolution is, just a matter of like there, we have different uh, capabilities that what we're seeing with our we eyes would need, the camera can do. Correct. I would say, and I'll be very open and blunt about this. I would say that in order to, for example, d- detect or pick up some, I'm oversimplifying. So, uh, but if this does end up working, someone, please let me know. But if you took two concave lenses and you overlap them, that interference zone in the center there, is where you should be able to get more of a clear view of the craft. If you and we know, for example, that concave lenses are what is are um, inside of the James Webb Telescope, which is interesting because again, the only other uh, telescope that had a concave lens, to my knowledge, in the past many decades, was the Mister James Santilli, the Santilli Telescope, that was called nonsense, and he was claiming to see craft and certain be- energetic beings in the sky with his concave lens telescope. So that gentleman's work is nonsense. But for some reason, when James Webb has a concave lens, it's fine. Yeah. So goes to show there's gatekeepers everywhere, especially in the academics and experts community, right? Uh, I think that's and I'm not taking a jab and just be yeah. clear, I'm not taking a jab at, at Avi Loeb or anybody. I'm just saying it's pretty ironic when you look at the the same way that there are many scientists right now, some many of which I know personally that are saying certain things are not possible publicly and then privately working on the things that you would think are are magic. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. But yeah. uh, going back to the double helix again, it, you know, it starts to make me think about DNA, right? Where it yes. does feel like we see yes. these patterns everywhere. You see it in yes. biology, you are seeing it in physics, engineering. Yes. I think that's what to me gives it even more credit is that there does seem to be this underlying factor of curvature in everything right. about our reality. Um, 100%. If you search up, for example, even on Google, uh, quantum curve space time, you'll now begin to find articles that say, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but mysterious phenomena shown when space time is good. See, it's a slow drip feed of what has already been known and worked on and engineered and dare I say perfected to varying degrees for many decades now. So here's another topic, which I, if you feel uncomfortable talking about, feel free to stop me. But uh, superconductivity, sure. you brought up superconductivity. I think that the chat would like to know, and I would like to know as well, is, um, you know, we've seen LK99 in the past few yeah. months as well. And when I saw LK99, my personal opinion was that I think that this is legitimate uh, because I've seen the videos of flux pinning. And we're talking about room right. temperature superconductivity now, not just mm-hmm. normal superconductivity, but room temperature. Right. Um, do you think that room temperature superconductivity um, you know, can or must be created from metamaterials, or can it also be induced by uh, electromagnetics, electrogravitics, whatever you want to think of it? So I'm I'm going to say something that's largely unpopular amongst the people that I I, I know and or work with, etc. Yeah. Because which is that, and we discussed this uh, yesterday. Um, which is that it is of my humble opinion that the focus on metamaterials. Um, and the analysis of them and their isotopic ratios and all of that is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But to induce the effects we are seeing, whether it's the Paez effect or tapping the zero point as Pudoff has said in the past or uh, Dr. Eric Davis or your 370 videos, you do not need metamaterials whatsoever. Now, putting that aside for a moment, you may say, OK, what what induces these effects? Well, various forms of uh, plasmas and certain gases, various forms of light, um, various forms of uh, superconductors, in addition to, um, and this is where it gets quite controversial, the induction of room temperature superconductivity using normal metals. Mm-hmm. And so it is of my humble view that the push for the analysis of metamaterials and such is to not necessarily detract, but dis- distract from the fact that uh, this can be done without metamaterials. Now, with that said, I don't have uh, something against metamaterials. And we think, for example, okay, what is that? Well, a meta- if we, for example, engineer the, uh, we manipulate the isotopic ratio of, say, magnesium bismuth, and then we put a thin film, you know, superconducting layer over it with yeah. maybe fiber optics. In theory, that's a meta material because it's a material that we have now manipulated and it's in a meta state, if you will. So I'm not against that, but it's not, it's also not needed. That is not needed to be done. This is something I said for quite some time and I've gotten some flack behind the scenes for it, but I think that it, people have the right to know in uh, particularly when you look at the work of um, uh, before World War II and especially before World War I, this notion of airships and compressed air, these pneumatic forms of tr- transportation that were clean. And it was just using compressed air, forget anti-gravity, forget generating gravity waves, uh, just using compressed air. 
So, um, the, you know, that, that brings me into a whole rant of, as well as, you know, for example, the common home heat pump uh, in everyone's homes, for example, technically have the ability to allow you to uh, induce what's called COP, coefficient of performance over one, meaning you can use the, the you know, the empty space or the vacuum uh, and the ions from it to compress air. But there's been a diabolical design globally um, where when it cools off outside, you're back on resistance heating. So you're stuck in a closed loop system instead of an open loop one. So essentially, one of the few reasons that we're still building COP coefficient of performance less than one is because uh, closed current loop circuits restores Lorentz symmetry and doesn't let you use the ether or the vacuum to extract the type of energy that we would see to power homes infinitely or to do the effects that we've seen in the, in the 370 videos. So that's so you're the Pac-Man mouth is closed instead of being open. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. Um, so what I was going to say, uh, which, sorry, if I very quickly from a go, visual go sense, yeah, yeah. the Pac-Man's mouth when it's open is looks identical to Maxwell's quaternions on Wikipedia, by the way. Yeah. So it's just an interesting visual to correlate because if you do the math, it translates to that visually. Um, so and just real quick for my chat, um, people want to know what LK99 is. So LK99 oh, yes. yeah. was um, I was just going to say, you know, and you can feel free to correct me here is a recipe that was came out of Korea and I think also China, but mostly Korea that essentially said you can take copper and lead. And if you heat it under the right uh, using the right recipe that you can produce a superconductive room temperature, superconductive uh, element or metal, however you want to think sure. of it. Yeah. Right. Is that how you would describe it as well? Um, uh, certainly it is of my knowledge, certain things have, have been done privately. I know, for example, there was a paper mm -hmm. published all the way back in 2001 that indicated, um, a combination of copper and gold, for example, that when yeah. melted to a certain temperature, it created room temperature, superconductivity, and then it later got retracted as per usual. Those are the ones you're going to want to look for, for, <laughs> for, for uh, your, your lovely audience. Um, with that said, do I personally think two things I'll say about LK99 in particular. I haven't looked into it enough to say for certain. My surface level analysis is that it is purely diamagnetic and not room temperature superconductive. I could be wrong. With that said, putting LK99 aside, I know for a fact that room temperature superconductivity does exist and has for quite some time. One can make an argument that uh, without jumping all over the place here, yeah. these ancient um, uh, cathedrals that seem to have very peculiar geometric properties and organs inside of them with piezoelectric bricks made out of them may have in fact been room temperature superconductive buildings that were used for healing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But anyways... Well, that's the, really cool. I think that the I've idea been that into, if, yeah, go ahead, keep going. the idea is that if you have a resonance within the vacuum that has a an ideal state of your cells in a healthy manner, sort of like going back to our stacked books example, if you're on book number ten and you're you know your your cells are cancerous, you can then what this this resonance does just by being inside of these cathedrals ideally is it takes essentially uh your body when it was at say book three in a healthy state and brings it up to book 10 and you are now essentially very healthy um we've seen this been uh, also be promoted uh pre-world war one um for those that have the really old magazines and that kind of stuff uh you know with using cathodes and you know ray tubes and all this kind of stuff putting it all over the body but of course you know, interestingly enough, we didn't hear about any of that after the war. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, just for my audience, too, I want to go back to something you were saying about some other metamaterials, bismuth, zinc and magnesium seems to be sure. a, a common combination that I hear a lot about in UFOlogy. Um, so I, I just think that there might be something there. I'm just curious as to if you have any just quick thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll be super open in one sense. I know, for example, that certain people have done certain things to bismuth. And when bismuth was put into a concave like shape, it began to exhibit properties that it otherwise would not have. Um, these are people just like, you know, mel melting it and applying a couple of other things to it electrically in their homes. Um, so I don't want to give away too much, but I do know, for example, these were people taking bismuth from shotgun shells. So what I'm trying to say is there are components to a lot of these elements uh, and materials that we um, that are right in our faces that we are sadly not familiar with. And I'm familiar, for example, with a certain group that had to uh, that found some very interesting things using just resonant frequencies. And they themselves had to uh, were very frustrated because they could um, they could not publish these results. Um, they were able to induce, dare I say, a form of uh, 
alchemy using the polarizable vacuum approach, which is, again, the curving of space time and then using the positive and negative electric charges to, uh, dare I say, birth something out of the phase conjugate curves that were induced in the laboratory on these materials. Yeah. And I'll yeah. repeat for people that are out there that are thinking that, you know, this is just blowing their minds or what have you. This is why this is hard truths, guys. This is why we're in here. These are the truths that people are going to have a hard time accepting and you need an open mind to get to them. Um, Dave, this is awesome. Do you want to take a look at the videos with me real quick? And we can just, I would love to hear your opinion sure. on the science, what you think is happening. I know yeah. you already kind of have referenced them multiple yeah. times. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so that we can get this officially in the recording. Okay, so here we go. We got that technical difficulties resolved. So these orbs come flying in right away. And the first thing that I noticed that I'm curious about your thoughts is that it seems like it flies past the plane. And then it kind of it looks like it's trying to look for it here. I don't know. This isn't necessarily like super in-depth in the superconductive or science perspective. But to me, it looks like it's like tracking or looking for the plane. Um, what are your just general opinions on that when you see this come flying in like if, this? And I say this in a speculative manner, yeah. assuming these these orbs are in a um, sort of detection mode, if you will, the what I would speculate that it, what is occurring here is there is a sort of that orb is looking for a resonant lock in with mm -hmm. respect to the other orbs it, relative to the mass that it's looking to transfer or uh, reduce the weight of or uh, again uh, perturb hmm. the local space time metric around it that's normally what i would uh this is again without the actual data itself that's yeah. what i would speculate and of course with regards to the vortex like behavior that is um all but very familiar to a lot of my experimental work uh to a like to to a t so yeah. i can say that for for those that again um think that it's fake or something like this we also have to keep in mind that the video editing software that it gets put through again by definition of not even having the code embedded in it of understanding a higher symmetry effect will seemingly try its best to sort of render the effects that it could in a flat space-time assumption or presumption and this is not to say that uh vfx software is the only thing that assumes a flat space time we can say arguably that all of our cameras assume a flat space time uh which create which is what gives rise to the pixelation and therefore the inability to see past a particular point of that curvature which would then be another dimension uh directly above it and so these effects that we're seeing and that i see here yeah. are vastly vastly um uh, similar to what I'm familiar with. And so I think what we're seeing as well is that uh, we're seeing a, a depot, dare I say, um, a focusing of energy that uses literally the entire uh, space time metric or vacuum or ether around it to induce the effect that we see. And this, this yeah. triangle, this also yeah. speaks to, by the way, the breaking of uh, the breaking of local symmetry. We we see, for example, that Li and Yang won the Nobel Prize for this back in 1957. Um, this is not anything that is out of the ordinary, if you will. We see that E. T. Whitaker. In 1903, 1904 showed that using partial derivatives, you can in fact, and the Z axis um, in a longitudinal sense, you can induce these effects and stabilize uh, disequilibrium. So the idea would essentially be that you'd have very similar to like a tree trunk for those that are that are not so scientifically uh, minded, you'd have the trunk that controls the other branches of the tree, as we know, or as the, it stands as sort of the supporting point. But what we're now being told publicly is that there's no trunk there's just the branches so we can liken the branches to the x and y axes respectively and then we can liken the trunk of the tree to the z axis or the z axis that is not seen unless one is actually up close in that effect which is why i keep saying at best when you're away from it you're going to see at best the flat intersection of that phenomena and or the flat intersection through either your own eyes or the the, the cameras that are filming such yeah. So what is your thoughts then on, on this pattern that they're doing here? In this it's, 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 it's breaking the local symmetry of the space time metric uh, it, it, to induce what Hochberg and Visser showed in out of Los Alamos in the 1980s to hmm. induce what seems to be here in, in my, again, speculative, speculatively uh, a traversable wormhole. Essentially hmm. it's using resonance to 
uh, break the local space time metric around the object, in this case, the plane that it's looking to transport. And it is essentially building that resonance up um, in a vortex like manner to then create at the zero point a, uh, a curvature in space time that, again, will give the effects as we've seen here that induce things like, again, uh, you know, non locality, spooky action at a distance, um, a teleportation, which we know has been done at least fundamentally by transferring yeah. quantum bits or quantum information. Why that hasn't been proposed to be scaled up publicly is, an, is another interesting thing. But yeah. Yeah. So you think then that there's, it's not just a matter of scanning or mapping the plane here. You think there's some type of electromagnetic or other type of force at play here while they're actually doing this spinning, they're interacting with one the another while they're probably, doing this? Yes, the orbs are probably super conductive. What they're essentially doing is they're locking in at the Planck scale with regards to mm -hmm. the local space-time metric around the plane and then inducing, uh, whether through lasers that would come out of the orbs or whether through um certain pre-programmed uh let's say electromagnetic and harmonic decibel frequencies make the plane uh go through or experience the effect that we see where it suddenly just disappears but i would say the lead up to that is a yeah. resonant type of buildup, very similar to um uh, sort of like a, a z pinch if you will so they're not even being pre they're not even being remotely controlled then they would be pre-programmed is that what i'm hearing is that okay, um, it can be uh, as i understand it can be remote controlled but it can also be pre-programmed absolutely to find a particular mm -hmm. if it's pre-programmed with a set of you know to look for a certain mass that then has that mass dare i say transport or make it disappear um or remove the weight or the internal mass of that object from one point to another uh, I, I certainly would say that it can definitely be done. Okay, well, that one was awesome. Let's take a look at the second video then. And I appreciate all your insights on that. That really helps me a lot as well. Can you see the second video? Yes. Okay, awesome. I'm going to full screen this. So this is the second video, guys. And this is the MQ-1C Gray Eagle, where we can just see the nose of this drone right here, right off the bat. And somebody actually in one of the comments of one of the recent podcasts said that their friend works for General Atomics and that this is what one of their drones would look like as well. Now, in this one, the leaker is uh, taking this multispectral electro IR camera and added this thermal layer in over the top of it. And again, we can see these orbs just ignoring gravity here. And one point right away, I want to point out once we get to this orb that we see, I want to snap a shot it right when we see it, is that you mentioned something about the camera is not being able to pick this up and correctly in three dimensions and it would look flat to us. Do mm. you think that may be part of the reason why the orbs look just kind of circular here, or is this just naturally, you know, actually we're still seeing them in three dimensions or what is your thought? That would process? be, that would certainly be a factor. And you see yeah. where, do you think we're seeing the uh, non radiating barrier here around this, or do you think that this is a solid object then? I think it, it again, um, I would uh, speculate that it is a solid object that has created a uh, alteration of the local space time metric around it using plasmas and Bose Einstein condensates. So it is completely voiding mm -hmm. space and time, therefore not having to abide by the gravitational rules that, you know, fighter jets would have to. Yeah. And um, it's a sorry for yeah. you. It's like a, if I can give a quick example. Sure, for you please. Audience, it's like if you were in a swimming pool and you took a, a small a pocket of a little bit of water put mm -hmm. it inside of a um put it inside of a container of sorts or a balloon if you will and then put it back in the pool that water that is inside of the balloon is not touching the rest of the water on the outside and the balloon mm -hmm. therefore allows for that water on the inside to push and pull the balloon in ways that it wouldn't be able to if that water in the balloon was immersed with the rest of the pool oh. Did you ever, uh, you're probably a little too young for this. There used to be a toy called Balzac and it was a, it was a, uh, ball and there would be like a water ball in it. And when you threw it, it would just like move around super weird. For some reason, that description that you just gave me kind of makes me think of that. I, I know what you're talking to, uh, yeah. what you're talking about. And that would be a very nice example about the way that it kind of just jerks around in that mm -hmm. regard. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. The next part I want to talk about is you can already see these lines, these dark trails. Uh, we have another version that shows them a little bit more clearly, which I'm just going to switch over to really quickly, mm. um, because this is the next thing I really want to ask you about here is when we see these trails, they're in front of the orbs. I mean, this looks like they're running on train tracks to me. You can see these trails are actually in front of the orbs here. 
What is your thought theory hypothetical about what is causing it? When I talked to Salvatore Pius, the impression I got would be that these are like a pulse that is um, either breaking down the space-time vacuum and creating their own geodesics that way, or there's creating a vibrational effect that is allowing this breakdown of the um, you know local space-time vacuum to create these train tracks, I'm going to call them for lack of a better term, that is their own geodesics that they're just being pulled along. What, what is your thought? You remember, I completely agree with Sal. If you remember what I said at the beginning of this regarding second harmonic generation, that is what gives rise to this effect right here. Yes, I would, I would say... I would just add simply the second harmonic generation allows for a gradient in the local metric that when induced with a dielectric um, current capacitor, et cetera, uh, can start to do some very interesting effects. And when combined with, for example, lasers in a directional sense um, can, can emit and absorb the, uh, and in, rather induce the effects that we're seeing here. So if I could stand on Dr. Paez's yeah. shoulders, humbly i would say in other words it's giving rise to the macroscopic quantum effects that are done via phase conjugation through second harmonic generation that induces a gradient within space time that that creates these effects here through things like bose einstein condensates mm -hmm. that can then again do things that would otherwise be considered impossible with solids uh, but can be done with plasmas yeah um and maybe this is a little bit redundant to what we were just speaking but how is it you think that it seems like the center of mass is the plane itself? Do you have any theories on how they're like staying stuck to this plane and this pattern that they are? Because they come in at sure. Mach 3 speeds, right? So they're coming can, in at unlimited okay. speed, but then they kind of match the speed of the plane perfectly here. You Essentially, what you want to do is in this particular case, if you're looking to do whether it, what, what we're seeing here, mm -hmm. um, you want to make the plane your center axis of symmetry. In terms of, for example, instead we talk about you know a relative rotation, but in this particular case, what we're looking at here is actually something called absolute rotation, where we are essentially create allowing the orbs to resonate and lock in with the the internal mass of the plane that comprises the plane, and so that resonance combined with the effects that the orbs induce allow then for the very focused amount of energy to interact at the Planck level with what we can call the Zitterbuegung, or what's in German translates to in English, the, uh, the the jittering thing as it's been called. Because in quantum mechanics, and I'll come full circle with this, it's been shown that, for example, if you push a kid on a swing, and even after the kid gets off the swing, and the swing is what looks to us as staying still, at the Planck level, it's still oscillating. It doesn't stop. And so if we can lock in with the oscillation of the, not of a swing, but of a plane, then we can see and we then create a form of absolute rotation around the axis of the plane, lock in with the resonance, use a Bose-Einstein condensate to induce its own geo, uh, geodesics in front of itself. You can then have the exact effects that we're seeing through the curving of space-time and the second harmonic generation. That's awesome, man. Thank you for that explanation. Greatly appreciate that. No problem. So, um, so then I think we'll get to our main event here. You know, So if we let this go in here, First thing I noticed is that if this was fake, I wouldn't expect to see frames like this where the plane is out of view. This is because they've zoomed in and they're you know manually trying to track this. Right. Um, I was listening to Matt Gates uh, on the UAP hearing, and one thing he mentioned was that there was an incident that he had seen where the operator had to use manual tracking for some UAPs that were out there. I just thought real quick, do you have any comments on that? Or do you think that there might be a situation where due to what we're seeing here, they can't be tracked automatically due to them being, you know, separate themselves from space time? Yeah. Yes, you can. Basically, there are um, uh, there have been this is actually nothing new. This is came, this has been around long in the defense field long before I was even around. Uh, you can make um, fighter jets and things like this either see multiple objects that are not even there see things that are uh that would otherwise be in other different places mm -hmm. um and essentially manipulate the radar to the point where you would need a human behind it um yeah to to look specifically or know what to look for these things can because they void the local space time metric they become completely undetectable in any way shape or form the only way to detect them is to then use the same technology that it is emitting but this time you use it as a detector instead of an emitter and this goes back to what we discussed about things with concave lenses and so on and so forth 
And uh, I think because some of the people in the the chat want to know as well, and I, I think I know the answer already, but do you, why do you think that there's three of them? I, I think the assumption is that's the minimum required to build a uh, geometric shape in two-dimensional space-time. That's the minimum amount required to break the local symmetry of any metric. Okay. You need so we need to. It, it's as simple as thinking back to the x and y axis on the Cartesian plane, but then we need a third axis, the z axis, which is some of the papers that I've sort of tried to hint mm -hmm. to your your lovely audience in the past uh, okay. hour and a half about. Um, in terms of there's an entire component. When I gave the example about covering the bottom half of the water bottle or the trunk of the tree not being acknowledged, these are all practical examples of what I'm trying to describe uh, scientifically relative to what we're seeing here. The if with two orbs, this would not have worked. You need three. Yeah. You need a minimum of three. And then three corresponds to essentially the broken symmetry of a particular particle or an event or um, space-time metric, if you will. So three is very, uh, very crucial. Interesting. Okay. Well, I think let's jump to our main events about to happen. And that's what tells me, I think that based on those answers that to me, what we're looking at here is an operation. This is already something I've speculated, but if these are things that can't be manually tracked or automatically tracked and have to be manually tracked, and we're zooming in on them here, as we see in a second, and then we're zooming out right before this event happens. And we know that this is some type of uh, pattern that has purpose. Then to me, this says that whoever was filming this knew something was about to occur. They're trying to get as much information about it. Um, and this goes to one of my questions before we start talking about the zap, which is, do you think that the military films in these electro IR cameras to collect data on exactly these types of anomalous events? Because I can't understand otherwise why we wouldn't be using optical cameras for this type of things. The multispectral cameras seem like they're intentionally designed for this. So I'm just curious your opinion on that. I think yes, to a certain degree. I think this is where it gets a little bit not complicated, but complex in the sense that mm -hmm. whether it's certain departments of the military or of the contracting field or a mix of both in a hybrid sense, I do believe there are much more advanced forms of detectors that can see these things more clearly in every way. But I do believe that the viewing of such to relative to those sailors or soldiers that do not have access to such technology and equipment, this would be probably the next best thing. Yeah, that's awesome. So, OK, I appreciate that. Now, this is just some uh, close ups. And this is actually part of the original regicide on video is that they actually do these close up slow mo's of the orbs that you can see here. Right. And you, you can kind of see them distort a little bit. And then we get to the slow-mo of what I refer to as the zap. But I think the more accurate term is the macroscopic phase conjugation that's happening. So mm. I would like to hear your opinion because you just mentioned that you think these orbs are having purpose here. You know, they're inter they're interacting with one another. They're breaking down yeah. the local phase time or space time metric. And right. do you think then that when we're going to see them converge here, and I think we're going to see, I don't know if the monopole is the right term, but they seem to be focused all their um, relative important part, you know, focused towards the middle of the plane if at you, the same time. If, if they're, they're essentially, what they're doing is they're creating, a, a, how can I put, I got, sorry, I have to watch my words here. They're, okay, inducing, they're inducing a quadrupole moment, essentially. And what I mean by that is, uh, a quadrupole are multiple dipoles laid over each other. But the reason that you, a quadrupole quad meaning four, you'd say, why is there not a fourth orb then if that's the case? That's because the fourth potential has to be left open the same way we talk about opening Pac-Man's mouth via the A field, uh, the magnetic vector potential to induce in this particular case, uh, if there if this is a transportation effect uh, to allow for the fourth point of that quadrupole to be in the place where they wanted to transport the plane. If that makes sense. When you say um, they wanted to transport the plane, are you saying that's where they want to induce the singularity or is this also some way of determining the direction of travel of the plane? Sure. If you're, well, let me simplify it actually in a way that I think I probably could do much better. If you're looking to teleport an object, let's just say, right. Or transport it from one point in space to another point but very far away in distance. What you would do is you would have three orbs surround or three of these orbs with this ability surround the object that you want to tell, say teleport speculatively. And then you would have the fourth orb at the location that you want to bring it to. Really? And this, is, this would be your Einstein spooky action at a distance. You do one thing on one side of the planet and it immediately occurs on the other side of the planet as well. It's those same type of concepts essentially. 
So that's really interesting because we have been speculating in part of MH370X investigation that are, are there other orbs on the other side? What I heard from you is that you might need just one other orb that is essentially entangled somehow. It could, well, it, it speaks to completing the full quadrupole, which would be the squaring of a circle if you were to visually look at it, which goes right back to the square root of the electric permittivity of the local vacuum in addition to these Planck cubes that we talked about. It's pretty, it's, it's not that diff. It's just different ways of looking at it, but it's not, I do agree with Dr. Paez when he says that um, it's a new perspective on something that's been right under our noses for a very long time. Yeah. I like when you put that too, because it goes back to that idea that we're just building on old science and we're taking another right. look at it, looking at it differently, but we're not cheating the system in any way. Right. We're not um, no. changing how science operates. We're just building upon it. B basically, if if I can say very quickly with regards Please. to, I would, I'm not a betting man, but if I had to bet money, there's, there was a fourth orb uh, that would be stationed at the G um, the geographical point in which this plane would have wanted to, in which certain people would have wanted to bring this object towards. And an mm -hmm. example of that is very simple. The way people may say, okay, how does, how is this connection made between the fourth orb or the p potential fourth orb and the three that are around it. Think about an elastic band stretching between the plane and where the fourth orb would be. That induces through that longitudinal component, that Z axis, that trunk of the tree that we cannot see in flat space time, that induces the tele at minimum light speed the ability for matter to appear from at one point and then appear on another point simultaneously. So you're essentially creating a uh, a non-visible elastic band between the plane and where you would want to bring the plane. And the way you do that is you break the symmetry of the uh, around the object of the local vacuum that you want to in, teleport, if you will. And then you have the fourth and final point of that quadrupole inductance, which is the second harmonic generation effect. You would have the fourth point at where you'd want to bring it. Wow. The same, and, the same way you have cell towers, basically. Yeah. It's the same concept. Yeah. And does, with this direction of travel, does it matter that the plane is focused on a certain direction? Does it go forward, no. backward? Can it go any way they want it to go? As long as the orbs, as long as the orbs induce the resonant effect around the plane and they fit to the plane's um, pro, uh, tr uh, direction of propagation and so on. No, there's no, it doesn't matter. Awesome. And so um, the next question then is this frame that we're looking at right here. We can mm -hmm. see the plane blur in this frame. We can see what looks like gravitational yes. lensing to me on these orbs, which yes. this is the part where I'm like, nobody faked this, guys. Like, this is a uh, way, like, it's too natural here. The other part that's interesting is that the plane gets a little bit smaller compared to the frame right before this. So do you yes. think this is indicative of some acceleration effect that's happening here, the gravitational effect beginning there, at there this Dare I point? say it's a combination of uh, infolding, as uh, E.T. Whitaker and David Bohm were uh, big proponents of, uh, Bohmian mechanics, but it is also an indication of the local metric being warped and perturbed, uh, sort of like jello to the point where it becomes, the, the solid objects don't become solid. <laughs> So this is like the beginning of the phase conjugation occurring and we're just kind of seeing it. And this is what you think. It would essential, look like. if essential, I would, I would bet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then from this effect that we see here, what is your thoughts? So in the satellite stereoscopic video, we see uh, some illumination happen from this event, but we can see from this video here, that's an endothermic cold event. Why do you think that there is illumination happening? You know, that, uh, this uh, light that illuminates the clouds. What, what is your theories behind that? That is very similar to that of um, uh, this. Sorry, I have to. It's a lot more straightforward, in my opinion, than many may think. This is, speaks very much to um, uh, very quick laser pulses, uh, particularly within the ultraviolet spectrum. Um, I, I, so I need to forgive me. I need to be a little bit careful in that regard. No, please because do. It's quite um, the. Let's just say that certain, and not just in this case, but in other cases, there have been people that have claimed to, and forgive me, I don't mean in this case, but certain people have claimed to see certain colors when craft take off in a light or in a photonic sense that correspond directly to what we know in the laboratory to be an ultraviolet pulse. And so when we see this effect, I think what we're seeing essentially is the residue of, um, how can I put it, uh, sort of like if the, if this speculative wormhole had a uh, an hourglass like shape to it but we cannot see it in its full 3d form going back to our main topic of because everything's assumed to be a flat space time with our detectors and so on um 
what we would have essentially is that sort of light that's that illumination is sort of the indicative of the sort of tapering off uh resonance that is closing up that temporary uh we could say pocket in space time or uh opening in space time that was made oh if the that's same way awesome. that the same way that you pulse a laser basically okay well i appreciate that that's really amazing um, so I think we've learned a lot here. Now, one last thing I have on these videos, and then I just want to sure. talk to you briefly about just some of the Im implications of all this technology. Um, so let's just say hypothetically, there's a lithium ion battery fire on this plane. <laughs> just, yeah. Let's just assume that. Do you right. think that this event could absorb the energy out of those batteries? Do you think it could? I mean, it's cold as well. I know. It, I know. What for do you think it could do to that? I know for a fact that it can transfer the mass of that of of that those batteries either into mm -hmm. the orbs. It can transfer the mass, uh, let it dissipate into the into the ether or the vacuum, mm -hmm. and then um, I know for a fact that it's possible and very feasible to do uh, using lasers and and pulsed uh, uh, pulsed laser effects and electro optical biofringent uh, effects. Um, and if you had a uh, certain types of um, phase conjugate crystals that were and put inside of lasers and those lasers were put inside of the orbs you can definitely have these effects yeah yeah awesome that's uh that's huge thank you very much for that i think that helps us to understand what but, i had already speculated the, no problem the idea would essentially be we have to keep in mind there's a difference between mass and weight of an object and if we think of we ultimately publicly we don't know what mass is if we think of mass mm -hmm. being simply the internal resonance of an object we think about the ability to then if we can transfer that resonance from the plane to then where the, the outer shell of the plane is still intact but its internal mass has now been the same way that if we take that water in a balloon example imagine you pop the balloon and then the water just naturally goes into the rest of the swimming pool and it just kind of embeds itself into the rest of you know life or nature if you will the same the same thing works with mass in, in that sense so that's why when a lot of people say, for example, you know, things like cold fusion are not possible because mass behaves in a certain way. I would say very strongly that mass behaves. Basically, you can you can you can make any object warp like jello under the right conditions of phase conjugation, manipulating that mass, mm -hmm. the internal mass of an object, which is why, for example, I think we've seen ancient, you know, uh, structures that have been so precisely cut. Our current modern, you know, laser beam cutters couldn't even do it, and that's because, in my opinion, there was such precision with regards to the resonance of the toroidal nature of of life, if you will, that the lock-in resonance of that making that phase conjugation allows for the cutting of the stones, the transportation of large ob objects, to be literally as light as a penny in terms of its internal mass, if you can dissipate the mass from it, and therefore, again, open Pac-Man's mouth to let the mass leave an object. And then, again, you can essentially make it as light as possible while still having the outer frame of said object very intact. That kind of blows my mind, because I've been sitting here wondering as I watch stuff like Graham Hancock's uh, uh, anthropology, archaeology, where he's looking at these structures and formations that were built right. tens, 20,000 years ago. Yeah. And they just seem impossible, especially if we're dealing with hunter gatherers that were not organized, you know, right. it does feel like maybe they weren't necessarily more advanced from an iPhone perspective, but they mm -hmm. at least had some concept of these advanced geometry, advanced uh, science, physics, and engineering that we are still to us, you know, for them, you know, maybe they were more advanced in some ways and we are more advanced in other ways, you know, so that's just kind of what my current theory is. So I thought that I'm I, this is why I really appreciate the conversations that you have with people like Sal Paez, because the one thing I've said many times over is that if any form of our ancestors had any uh, interaction with this type of science, um, as we said earlier about science versus tech, they were not running, you know, Stokes integral theorems and vessel functions and all this kind of stuff for them was very simple. They maybe didn't even call it this, but we understand electricity, magnetism, light, sound, simple. What can we do with it? Clearly, this is a very simple approach that unifies everything. Once one begins to see the perspectives that uh, that can be taken in a sense of not needing these overly, and this is no jab in anybody to be clear, but not needing overly complex um, uh, mathematics and things like this. It might be so 
eloquently simple that it's been put right in front of our face whenever someone may have discovered the effects that lead to these things have scaled up maybe they've decided to just call it you know things like uh inverse faraday effect or you know very basic uh the london moment for example and then just kind of leave it there right no don't extrapolate on it but i think that i i know rather that these effects are very feasible and this is when the cognitive dissonance mixed with the lack of ability to detect the appropriate data that would give rise to understanding this science and physics comes into play and that's when the unfortunately the system has done a very good job at that so yeah. Yeah. So I think that just again, to repeat what we said multiple times is that you don't have to believe what either Dave or I are right. saying. You can verify this information yourself. As long as you have an open mind, the answers are out there. The stuff that we've been reviewing today is not science fiction. It's science fact. People should look into this. If you're somebody who's an inquisitive mind out there, uh, you want to dig into it, realize you don't need to have any pedigree. Pedigree doesn't matter. What matters is you put the work in, you figure it out, you dig into the science, the papers are out there. Um, and, and you can kind of come to the same conclusions that we've been coming to here today. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, I think we've talked about a lot of these concepts, but if we bring it all back together in terms of what does this mean for this technology? What can it be accomplished? Right. We've already talked about teleportation, although I think that's a crude approximation of what we're really talking about here. But right. when we mean teleportation, we mean moving an object at the speed of light, potentially faster than the speed of light, similar to quantum teleportation, uh, according to the double slit experiment. Um, I think right. we didn't dig into it too much, but annihilation as well, just completely wiping something out with Bob Greenier. He and I talked a lot about the perfect defense mechanism where we could annihilate a nuke, annihilate any type of missile that yes. would be coming at us. Would you agree with that? Very much so. Essentially using the same effects or concepts we've discussed for the past 90 minutes and essentially it not have it, say, for example, have the mass transfer and reorganize elsewhere, which would be a form of teleportation, but rather have the mass just completely dissipate, whether it's the mass of, a, unfortunately, a person or the mass of a metal object. Size is not of an issue. So, yes, I strongly agree with Mr. Greenier. Yeah. And then some of the other aspects that we talked about, we definitely talked about free energy, in my opinion. We're talking about Pac-Man opening his mouth up, pulling energy right. from the vacuum state. I think that's something I already questioned before. But really, what you're, I think that your uh, takeaway conclusion is that if you open your system up, instead of making a closed system, I'm making an open system. Now you can open yourselves up to this idea of sucking energy from the vacuum state and you know having there be a, a release valve, so to speak, in terms of my layman's terms. Any other yeah. thoughts on that? Sure. One example I can give, and this is, a, I want to be clear, this is a crude, overly abstract example. So, and I'm not a, I'm not special. I don't specialize in the, uh, in, in certain, in the, in the medical area of this type of work. But one thing I can give an example of is we talk about, you know, people talk about things like over unity or open systems or uh, which would therefore open Pac-Man's mouth and extract this energy uh, or give and take that, you know, uh, receive and transmit this energy in and out of your object or your setup relative to the local space time or vacuum. Vacuum. We have to think about the possibility that these craft or these orbs may in fact be nuts and bolts versions of what we already are and what we already do. What I mean by that is think about and putting aside the con you know the, the angles of remote viewing and whatnot think about for a moment when you wake up in the morning and you have breakfast for example and you have such a busy day at work that you don't end up eating lunch or dinner but you still and you're still alive you can still survive you arguably have uh, exerted far more calories than you've consumed. By definition, one can make an argument that's over unity. You are a perpe perpetual motion machine. So why it cannot be done when applied to various other, you could say, solids, elements, plasmas, etc., again, has largely been for, I would say, political, controversial, bureaucratic uh, BS, um, particularly with how long it's gone on for. But I, I think that in addition to that, you this gives rise to things like uh, light speed or a faster than light speed communication. Uh, this definitely gives rise to things like medical healing, uh, particularly things like linguistic wave genetics. Dr. Peter Garyev, who unfortunately mysteriously passed away a couple years ago and mysteriously had his Nobel Prize retracted for essentially using the polarizable vacuum approach, what, which is what we've been discussing for the past 90 minutes, to essentially do the stacked book example of healing people, whether it's uh, PTSD, mental health, or actual cancer. Uh, he has a website, uh, Linguistic Wave Genetics, should be pretty easy to find. Um, but all having to do with, again, the same concepts of applying resonance in conjunction with this phase conjugation at the Planck level uh, that, create, that permits these types of interactions. 
Yeah, it seems like there is a lot of mysterious deaths in science, you know, and I'm just going to go ahead and say right now that I'm not suicidal. I have perfect mental health. I think from my interaction with you, you seem like you are also not suicidal, have perfect mental health as well. I'm good, um, man. I'm good. Yeah, I don't think either of us will, uh, you know, just be dying suddenly or anything like that. So, you know, it would be suspicious if that happened. That's all I'm saying. Um, but you did mention uh, faster than light communication, which is one of the things I wanted to touch on. Appreciate that. The medical healing aspect of it as well. I think that as well, we're talking about force fields here, right? We're talking about this non-radiating barrier. So one right. thing I think about is cloaking, you know, yep. this idea. And, and that's something that's been out there. Actually, that's probably the least controversial aspect of that's, all this that's science. Pretty, that's, pretty, right. that's pretty simple. I think that's actually been on Lockheed's website. They've subtly admitted to it for a while. I think it's Lockheed. Don't quote me on that. But that's that's... That's there are multiple ways to induce that. You don't necessarily need to bend uh, gravitational waves to bend light, although that is one way. There are many other ways that it can be done as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and sorry, we just got a big donation. I just want to thank DOP very much. Wow. Thank you very much for that. That That's really huge. And everybody in the chat, I, and I don't know if you've been able to see it, Dave, but people have been going wild in the chat. They are really appreciating this conversation right oh, now. Oh, I haven't. Unfortunately, I haven't seen. I will take a look back after this and, oh, and thank you to, to everybody. I, I, Honestly, I hope that I can uh, even stand on Paez's shoulders next Sunday when we do this to to give more credence. What we're trying to do here today, at least what I'm trying to do, is lay the groundwork. And then next Sunday, we'll perhaps uh, get a little more science if you will, in, in discussing that lingo and all of that. But oh, you yeah. just spoiled it for everybody. I was going to tell everybody. So hard oh. truths number four is coming. No, you're fine, Dave. I was I'm about sorry. to drop it. Hard <laughs> truths number four next week with Dave Rossi and Salvatore Paez. At the same time, it is going to be amazing, guys. If you liked what we're talking about today, you're going to love next week. We're going to have two heavyweights kind of going at it scientifically, talking about the videos, talking about the science like we were today, building on everything we've been talking about. Um, just a couple other quick scientific concepts I want to talk about. Fusion sure. power. You know, if we can have electromagnetic fields similar to what we can do with making something invisible, then I see no reason why you can't create fusion power within some very powerful electromagnetic fields as well. Would you concur with that assessment? One trillion percent. That's the there's been an old saying, I think uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but, you know, they talk about things like cold fusion and they always say, you know, cold fusion is 10 to 20 years away. Yeah, it's been like that for the last 60 years. So, yes, no, it's it's very feasible, very possible. Um I, I say it very confidently because if you can read between the lines, you and your lovely audience, uh, it's very feasible with yeah. whether it's with uh, low energy nuclear reactions or anything of the sort. Um, it, it's why I also I kind of laugh when I remember Paez saying on his first appearance on Kirchai Mungle show that uh, he initially tried to file some of his room temperature superconductor patents as high temp ones because hopefully it would have went through <laughs> a little easier. But it is it it is feasible. We have to remember as well. This is the um, it, it's 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 purely political as to why this stuff won't come out at this point. Purely political. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's my last piece is the politics side of it. So it, we've talked about a lot of amazing stuff where people go, this has got to come out. Right. And I am hundred percent in agreement with that, but we also have to look at the dark side of it too, which is yeah. when you have nuclear power, you have nuclear weapons, right? If you were to right. weaponize this type of technology, we might be in my mind dealing with stuff that I would call doomsday weapons, stuff that you would talk about super villains creating in movies. Right. Um, Bob Green, your mention when I said, you know, one of uh, Salvatore Pius's paper on high frequency gravitational waves mentions destroying an asteroid or a planet, uh, a yeah. planetoid, which then I just yeah. scaled up and said, OK, well, what about destroying a whole planet? And Bob Greener said, no, what about ta talking about destroying a whole sun? Right. Yep. And you can even scale it up even further, too. So what are your thoughts on that and how we should be responsible or cautious with this type of technology? Because my opinion is the people that are hiding this, that's the number one reason. Right. Uh, granted, the societal right. impact is huge as well. But from a national security perspective of giving an individual the capability to cause massive damage, that's the part yes. that I think people would be afraid of the most. So this is I something that I'm actually conflicted with. Now, I want to be very clear in saying that although I do know that this is a very serious concern, it should not be the reason that at least the, the knowledge of this should not should be hidden, that that should not be the forefront. Now, with that said, there is a very strong concern because of the fact that Here's the, and I, I've been saying this for those that have known me for quite a while now, which is that when you tap one aspect of this of this fundamental energy or super force, as Mr. Paez calls it, 
you tap the rest of it. What do I mean by that? It doesn't take much after you tap, say, an anti-gravitational component to say, my God, I can apply this to powering my own home. Or I can apply this to if I turn this sideways and with another five, six hours of adjustments to the device, I can turn this into something that I can go and very unfortunately, if I'm angry at my ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, go shoot at their house and now they've com- all the houses will fall like dominoes. It's a very serious concern and it's a very... Un- um, This is where, in my opinion, I think the element of, dare I say, moral slash spiritual maturity must come into play. The notion of simply not think, for me personally, I never think when I go into a lab, or even if I'm consulting on a contract, I never think, how can I weaponize this? That's not, that's not the thing. Now, there are people that certainly do, I'll be very honest with you. And that's unfortunately the concern, because Yes, in, in not just in principle and not just in theory, but as a matter of fact, it's been shown by whether it's Richard Feynman, John Wheeler, that there's enough energy inside of a coffee cup to evaporate the world's oceans. There's enough potential energy within the local space-time metric, the size of your hand, to evaporate a planet. And if that can be done through compacting enough energy inside of a high-frequency graviton emission, I completely agree with Mr. Greenier. You can do it. You can destroy a sun. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's th- why I think... Becomes- oh, go ahead. Sorry, I don't claim to have all of the answers, but I think that by divulging some of the conceptual framework as we have today, we can then perhaps discuss some of the more uh, practical elements. And I say that carefully because imagine, for example, with Paez, uh, you know, God bless him with his approaches and his patents in a fusion-like sense. Imagine you can do this with, with solid-state electronics. And that's ultimately where I know we talked about this yesterday. I tend to specialize more in the the solid state manufacturing of this. And what I mean is essentially small chip like devices that can essentially induce these effects equivalent to uh, Paez's work and and otherwise. And so that's when it it genuinely becomes scary. Um, It it really does. I'm not going to sit here and say it doesn't. So I agree. That's why I think that from the political aspect, if we were to reveal this, there is a lot of you know, laws or whatever we have to put in like kind of um, uh, safeguards, right, to ensure that we are going to use it responsibly. And we might even have to rise to the level of collective conscious where we are not going to destroy ourselves, right? Um, And so I am conflicted, just like you're conflicted, Dave, but I think that we are both people that come at this from the right attitude and from a good place. And I think all the people watching as well, I hope that they would as well. And realize that this isn't something we can take lightly. This is something that we do have to heavily consider when we are bringing this technology to the world and making it public. And that's why I want to have these adult conversations that we're having, talking about it, making sure that everyone understands it. I want to thank you for your time here today. And before I let you plug whatever you want to plug, I'm going to go ahead and make you an honorary member of MH370X, Dave. I think I am... Thank uh, you. I really appreciate all of your insights. I think that you've given us so much here today. But also in our past conversations, I consider you a friend. MH370X will come to your side, come to your aid anytime you need it. All you have to do is let us know and we will be there for you, sir. I I appreciate that so much. And if I can add one more thing uh, for your audience you and your lovely audience, which is that um, we gave, I, we talked about this yesterday on the phone, and I'd love to leave this as sort of a, a thought experiment to leave your audience with, which is that imagine you're inside of, for example, and this can also, this uh, subscribes to the stacked book concept, even when people talk about higher dimensions or higher, dare I say, even consciousness. But imagine you're in New York City in an apartment with your uh, with your window open, and it's freezing, it's December or January, and you have one blanket on you, for example, and you can feel the cold because there's only one blanket on you and it, it you only have one layer, which is not that much. And then your your partner comes in and says, here are another three or four blankets to put atop you so you stay warm. We're basically at the point, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to come on your show, where there is an element of the military industrial complex, particularly in North America, that is trying to... Ba- that is attempt that's doing its best to try and convince us that the other three or four layers on top of that first layer is not even there. And that is ridiculous. The fact that they're trying to get people to not think becomes a very serious problem. And so that's one that I just wanted to leave you uh, in your audience with an example like that. That's basically what's happening. And it's something that um, I know a lot of people on the inside cannot won't stand for, but their hands are tied with regards to the things they can say publicly uh, in fear of, unfortunately, losing not just pensions, but even members of families very sadly. So if I could very humbly speak on behalf of some of them, I can say that it's just getting way too, it's getting too much and people deserve to at, at the at least have an understanding of how this works. 
And so I, I want to thank you so much as well for making me a member, man. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, for those that are interested, because as, as you may have heard, for those that were here at the beginning of the show, I did have uh, I did start this before I got into the science side um, uh, with a with a podcast. And so uh, what we do now is a couple times a week for those that I that support me, I, I put out extra content uh, and extra papers um, that Ashton has some of that I don't really put out publicly. And it's um, patreon.com slash generation Z no spaces, no capitals. Uh, you're more than welcome. If anyone is interested in terms of a, a sort of consulting or contracting uh, side of uh, side of things, uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, directly. Um, even phase uh, phasehelix.com is the website that is used in addition to the uh, the consulting that I have for salt as well. And um, two different companies, depending on what needs to be done, depending on the, the contract and what have you. But I want to thank you again. For those that are interested, I also have a substack, davezed.substack.com. Uh, Z is Z-E-D, both in Generation Z and Dave Z. But yeah, that's also at Podcast Z, no space, no capitals on Twitter. And um, yeah, I want to thank you so much, uh, Ashton Brother, for having me on. And I really look forward to our conversation uh, uh, with Dr. Paez next week. Yeah, I'm looking forward to. And if you ever want me on your podcast, all you have to do is call. Uh, we'll definitely be in touch and we'll be talking. We're going to we're going to set that up 100 percent. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. I've been uh, very quickly for those that may uh, check out the generations at public side. I've been far less, uh, far slower in releasing content because I'm much more in into this uh, in, into the contracting field of things. But I want to thank you so much for allowing me to even promote that, because there are videos I've made in the past that uh that nowadays because of certain things I can't comment on, but at the time I didn't even realize I was so accurate about that. Maybe on even for those not interested in the Patreon can still see publicly and may give more hints to support what was even discussed here today and ultimately support uh, the 370 case overall. God, that's huge, man. I, I think I've been making so many connections with this. I am so grateful for everybody I've come across. I don't know if I would have ever met you without these videos and it, it just, it feels like there's another higher force bringing everybody together. Right. Uh, greatly appreciate it. You know, this was Hard Truths, number three, Ashen Forbes, Dave Rossi, giving you guys the information, the science that is hard for people to accept, but it's the hard truths. So thank you, everybody. Uh, have a great day.